Hey, Victory family, I hope you're having an amazing service today. Listen, I wanna ask you to keep me in your prayers. I am preaching for a revival in Oslo, Norway this weekend, and you're blessed to hear an incredible sermon from Pastor Ron McIntosh. He's gonna be stepping up in just a moment, but I'll be back in just a few days. I've got a message for you next weekend in our Kings and Queens series. I'm gonna give you some red flags to look out for in relationships. For all of you who are single or married, this is a message for you. But I believe God wants to speak to you today. And who you're gonna hear from today, Pastor Ron McIntosh, he's been a friend in my life, a mentor in my life for a long time. He's been a part of this church, teaches in our Bible college, writes curriculum for our Christian school. He's an incredible teacher on the Word of God. I know you're gonna be blessed today, so get ready, get your notepads out, get your Bibles out. Let's stand to our feet and let's welcome to the stage Ron McIntosh. We're in this series on Kings and Queens. And today we're gonna to talk about King Jehoshaphat, the power of one degree. And I believe that God's going to encounter people's lives here in this place today in a very unusual way. <clears throat> so let me begin by telling a story. Some years back I was doing a conference in the Chicago area. I was one of five main speakers at this particular conference. And the way this conference worked is you flew your speakers in on Saturday and you exported them, so to speak, to churches around the area. And the idea, I think, is that they would like what they heard and that would bring them to the conference when it started that Sunday night. So I was given to a church in Rockford, great church, 80-year-old pastor. This guy had been everywhere, had done everything, had been with everybody. And now he's finishing his life and his ministry in this church in Rockford. And as we were there... We had a great conversation ahead of time as to so many things that he had encountered in his life. And that particular morning, those of you who know me know I'm a teacher primarily, but that day I had a prophetic word for that congregation on Joshua. And I gave that word in that particular congregation, or when I gave the invitation, out of a thousand people, a thousand people came to the altar. Now, I'm used to big altar calls when I preach, but in a medium large church and 100% of the people coming, it, it, it was amazing. We kind of rejoiced together afterwards and I left and the conference was to start that night but another church heard that I was in the area and asked if I'd come minister to their congregation. I got permission and I did so. Preached an entirely different message because that prophetic word was not a fifth there. And when I gave the invitation in a church, a smaller church of 250 people or 300 people, 100% of the people came to the altar. I said, God, you must be up to something. And so I got ready to preach that night. I used to be one of two preachers at this particular conference that night. And as I was praying that afternoon, I got so uncomfortable. The discomfort, the longer I prayed, the discomfort increased. And the only thought that I had was maybe I'm not supposed to preach in that service tonight. Maybe the other person is supposed to take the whole service. So when I pulled up into the church, my driver let me off. I went in to the pastor's office and the other leaders and conference speakers were in there, and I pulled the pastor aside and said, Jim, maybe I'm not supposed to speak tonight. I have this discomfort inside of me. He said, Ron. He said, we advertised you people came to this conference because when you're here, he said, you're going to speak tonight, and if you don't, you're going to be the one who's going to have to tell people. And so, and so I'm sitting there during the worship, and the discomfort increases. And it just gets larger. And finally, the inevitable moment comes. He introduces me as the speaker of the night. And I stood in the pulpit. And I was silent for 60 seconds. Do you know how awkward that can be? And then I finally said, I'm not sure, quite sure what God is doing. And I was silent for 60 more seconds. And it went from discomfort to really being awkward. And finally, God speaks to me. He says, you are to speak spontaneously out of Ezekiel 37, the valley of dry bones. And when I got to the process where I, I got to verse 10 where it says, and they stood to their feet, a vast army without an invitation. People leaped to their feet and ran to the altar. And again, eventually, 100% of that crowd was at the altar. I, I just went with the flow of the Spirit. Signs, wonders, miracles broke out in that house. Some that were in direct correspondence to what I was doing. Some that were completely independent of me. This went on for some time. After a period of time, I turned the service over to the pastor. And he continued going on for a while. And I went over to a corner. I said, God, what are you doing? And finally, I heard this word come from God. 
He said, there's a shift coming to the body of Christ. Come on, everybody say shift. shift. Say it again like you mean a shift. shift. And I've begun to see that begun to unfold over these last couple of years as I travel various places. There is a shift that's come to the body of Christ. But I've also come to realize there's a different kind of shift that takes place. And it's the power of one degree. You say, what's the power of one degree? Let me explain it to you. The power of one degree, if you were to take water and heat it to 211 degrees, what you would have is hot water. But if you take it one more degree, 212 degrees, it begins to boil and it begins to create steam. And steam is the power that moves a locomotive. Now listen to me. I think that virtually every single person in this place is under the realization that there's something more. There's a breakout, there's a breakthrough, there's something coming, and it takes that one just element of the power of one degree for the power of God to invade a place. So, let me launch into what I have to say to you this morning because I have good news and bad news. I'm gonna start with the bad news and end with the good news. Here is the bad news. The bad news is this. Between two and three million teenagers in America run away from home in the land of the free and the home of the brave every single year. The second leading cause of death among teenagers is suicide. The first leading cause of death in children under five is parental abuse. The divorce rate in this country is 50% in first marriages, 67% in second marriages, 74% in third marriages. Now, I'm not here to condemn you if you had a divorce. I'm here to say that we have to learn to deal with our crises. And so what happens is, as you continue to go on, there are more New Age people in San Francisco than there are Assembly of God people in that same city. The third leading cause of death for African Americans is AIDS. There is literally hate in our political parties that's going on even before our very eyes. There's terrorism in the world. Now that's the bad news. How many of you ready for the good news? So here's the good news. Get ready to give me an awesome amen, complete with clapping of hands, stomping of feet, rolling in the aisles, and various and sundry aerobic exercises. I'll point at you to let you know when. Here it comes. You've heard the bad news. Here is the good news. The devil has brain damage. Yeah. And here's why I say that. Because he thinks he's creating fatalism, but instead there's a group of people who are being raised up in this hour that won't say no when God has said yes. Come on, is there anybody like that in this place here today? Now, I want to show you the power of one degree in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. If you're not turned there already, turn there. And we're going to talk about, yeah, go ahead, uh, King Jehoshaphat. Now, go ahead and put those eight Ps up there, and I'm gonna show you, if you're going ahead and taking notes, I'll give you a little outline of where we're headed. And I wanna show you some things here that I believe will literally release the presence and power of God in this place. Now, look at verse one. After this, the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Menunites, the Uptites, the Adicites, the Mosquito Bites, come on, how many of all them ites are in there? <laughs> came to make war on Jehoshaphat. And some of the men came and told Jehoshaphat, the vast army is coming against you from Eden from the other side of the sea. So number one, how many of you realize Jehoshaphat had a problem? Let me ask you a question. Everybody look this way. How many of you have had a problem in the last year? Can I see your hands, please? Now, if your hand did not go up, we have an altar call for liars in just moments. <laughs> we've, all, we've all had problems. And if you haven't had a problem, it's because you're not doing anything for the kingdom. If you're a believer and you're not doing anything for the kingdom, then he'll leave you alone. But let me just tell you something. Everybody doing something for God is going to have a problem. Now, here's what's interesting about this problem. It's a problem because there are three armies coming against his one. He doesn't have the manpower and he doesn't have the resources to deal with this. It is a problem without solutions. Many of us are running into problems. We don't know what to do because we don't know what the solution is. Now, I want to show you how he responds, verse 3. He said, alarmed, alarmed. Your Bible may say fear or great fear. And the Hebrew gives you the idea of dread or terror. He's terrorized. He's in fear. Now, let me show you something. I want to show you the top seven fears that take place in a common person's life. And here's what they are. Number one, the fear of failure. It's the number one most dominating fear in people's lives. Number two, the fear of rejection. 
the one that preachers have to go through every week when they speak to you. <laughs> Number three, FOMO. You know what FOMO is? The fear of missing out. Now, I want to tell you something. That'll cause you to do something that you shouldn't do. I can show you this in Acts 19 other places, but we'll just go on. Fear of change, the fear of the unknown, the fear of inadequacy, insecurity. I could go on with other fears, the fear of public speaking, the fear of death. They're there. And what happens is this. The one thing they all have in common is that fear paralyzes. It keeps you right from where you are. Now, let me show you the power of one degree. How did Jehoshaphat deal with his fear? Now, watch this. Alarmed in fear, terrorized. Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord, and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. Here's the power of one degree. The power of one degree is that you don't stay in paralysis, that instead you move to seek God for what he has in that particular situation. And the result is it'll give you, go ahead and put those P's back up there. It'll give you a new perspective. How many of you know seeking God will change your perspective? Now, let me, give you, let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. I was doing a meeting in Naples, and I preached that morning on faith, and I gave an invitation, and the altar jammed out. The entire altar was filled, and they were backed up the aisles. And when I was taking a look at what had taken place at that altar, I looked over to my right, and to the back edge of that altar call was a handsome Hispanic couple. And the Lord drew me to them and I said this. I said, the Lord has a destiny for your life, but your destiny is being challenged and it's being challenged physically. But the Lord says, don't fear that he is with you. I just went on and finished the service when I was done. It was in between first and second service and I was in the, in the, uh, <clears throat> out in the, the Narthex area and, and there in the lobby, they tracked me down. Here they came up, J.C. and Julia Mancera. And they said, you have no idea what you shared with us this morning. That word you gave us, he said, here's what happened. This week we have been to the doctor. They diagnosed my wife, Julia, with thyroid cancer. We were so devastated by the news that we decided we wouldn't come to the church. We would just deal with it. And we got to the church. I heard you speak on faith. And he said, that gave us a new perspective. And when I got a new perspective, I want to tell you something. We are full of faith. I said, I want you to come back tonight. They were having a Sunday night service. They don't normally have one, but they had one while I was there. And as I preached that night, again, the altar jams out, and yet they're in the front row, and they were the first ones down. I walked up. I laid my hands on Julia. The power got hit her. She fell out in the spirit. I want you to hear this. Most of the time when you pray for somebody, you really don't have any idea what's taking place. You leave and you have no idea what happens. But two to three weeks later, we got an email from JC and Julia Mancera. They said, we want you to, to hear this. I know you're going to believe it. They said, we've been back to the doctor. They re-diagnosed her and ran a new set of tests on her. They can't find any cancer whatsoever. Healed by the stripes of Jesus. What happens when you have a problem with no solution and fear begins to set in? Your response is you need to seek God. It gives you a new perspective. Now watch. Look at verse 5. Because something interesting happens here. Then Jehoshaphat stood up in the assembly of Judah and Jerusalem and at the temple of the Lord in front of the new courtyard. And he said, O Lord God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven? You rule over all the kingdoms of nations. Power and might are in your hand, and no one can stand, withstand you. Oh, he says, he says, our God, did you not drive out the inhabitants in this land before uh, your people of Israel and gave it to, uh, forever to the descendants of Abraham and your friends? Now watch. The moment he gained a new perspective, the next thing that happened is he looked into his past. Put the, the eight things back up on the screen. He looked into his past. Now, let me ask you a question. Everybody look this way. How many of you seated in this place, God has come through for you sometime in your past? Would you put your hands up? I want you to just wave them around a little bit. Look at this. I want you to see this. God didn't deliver you. God didn't save you in your past. Listen to this now. To condemn you in your future. Now 
Now watch this. Verse 8, because something interesting happens again. They have lived in it, and they have built in it a sanctuary for your name's sake. If calamity comes upon us, whether by the sword or judgment or plague or famine, we will stand in your presence before his temple and bears the name uh, the name, and will cry out to you in our distress, and you will hear us, and you will save us. Now watch this, verse 10. But now here are men from Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, whose territory you would not allow Israel to invade when they came to Egypt. So they turned away from them, and they did not destroy them. See how they are repaying us by coming to drive us out of the possession that you gave us for an inheritance. In other words, he's saying, this is a promised land. The next thing that happens after you remember what God has done for your path, he puts you in tension. He puts you in with a focus on what his promises are. 7,700 promises in the word of God. I don't care what your crisis is, what your problem is, what your dilemma is. I believe that there is a promise that is really directed toward your very situation. Now listen carefully. I want you to understand what it is that, that God is saying to us in the midst of this. Because once your promise begins to hit you, it creates what I see in Scripture called the law of expectation. The law of expectation is what you expect in your heart with confidence becomes self-fulfilling prophecy. So what happens, you have a problem that has no solution in it. You begin to seek God. It gives you a new perspective. You begin to recognize your past that God has come to you. And then you begin to embrace his promises for your life. Now, again, this is very interesting. Look at verse 12. Oh, God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that's attacking us. We do not know what to do, but... Our eyes are on you. Now, this is the principle of powerlessness. There comes a point where we realize that we are not having enough power to deal with the very situation that we're, we're involved in. So what happens is, here's where a lot of problems come, when people try to take it in their own hands. But it's not by might, it's not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so what happens is he intends for something to take place. You have to acknowledge your powerlessness. Well, watch this, though. Verse 14. Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel of Zechariah, the son of Benaniah, the son of Jael, Mataniah, a Levite, and the descendant of Asaph, and he stood in the assembly. Here's what he said. King Jehoshaphat and all you who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged because of this vast army. For the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Now hear me. In this place today, there are people that are facing crises in their life. But I'm here to declare to you, the battle is not yours. The battle is the Lord's. Look at verse 14. <clears throat> then the Spirit of the Lord came upon them. Let's drop down into verse 17. Now look at this. He says, you will not have to fight this battle. Take up your positions and stand firm and see the deliverance the Lord will give you. Listen to me. There is deliverance the Lord is going to dispense in this day. Now I want you to hear this. Because... To me, this is incredibly important. You sit there and you say, well, wait, if the battle's the Lord's and it's not mine, then I don't have to do anything. But that's not true. Everything that God does on planet Earth, according to Genesis 126, he has to do through a man. He has to do through a woman. He has to do through a person. So it, just because the battle's the Lord doesn't mean that we're not involved. Now watch this. Verse 18. So Jehoshaphat bowed his face to the ground. And all the people of Judah and Jerusalem fell down in worship before the Lord. And then came the Levites and the, and the Kohites and the Korahites, and they stood up and praised God and God of Israel in a very loud voice. Early in the morning, they left the desert of Tekoa. As they set out for Jehoshaphat, stood and said, Listen to me, Judah, and the people of Jerusalem, have faith in the Lord your God. You will be upheld. Have faith in his prophets, and you will be successful. So the next step after you understand the battle's not yours, but the battle's the Lord's, is preparation. He wants you to prepare. Now watch this. Put on the 
helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, your belt of truth, your feet shy with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Take up the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Now the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, in Greek is rhema, it's not logos, it's rhema, which is the saying word of God. It's revelation knowledge. Our preparation, listen, you didn't come here and sit in church to sit there and hear a message and nod your head in agreement without being transformed by it. You are here to hear the word of God, take it, make it revelation in your life because we are representatives of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords on planet Earth. Now, there are two Greek words for knowledge. One of those words is gnosis. The other is epinosis. Gnosis or epigenosco. Gnosis means knowledge that you acquire, that you experience in life. Epinosis or epigenosco is intimate, experiential, personal knowledge. It's revelation knowledge. This is what makes you ready for the battle to fight, for the Lord to fight on your behalf. Now, I almost went with King David today because he's my favorite Old Testament character. But let me give you a story. One of my favorite stories, the story of David and Goliath in 1 Samuel 17. So here it is, Goliath, nine feet tall, according to scripture. I mean, the Los Angeles Lakers, come on, everybody's trying to recruit this guy in the NBA. WWE is after this guy. He's a big dude. And every day he comes out in WWE fashion and intimidates all of the Israelite army. And they're cowering in fear when a little shepherd boy shows up at 16 years old and said, bringing his, his, uh, his brothers a little McDonald's lunch. And bringing his brothers McDonald's lunch, he's, he looks at this guy and he says, hey, look, wait a second. He said, I'll fight him. They say, you can't fight him. Now watch, here's the first thing he does. He goes back to his past and remembers when God came on his, on his behalf. He said, I've killed the lion. I killed the bear. I can kill this guy. And then he stands up and he says, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Why do you have to go and bring that up? You know what I'm saying? That's a strange thing to bring up. You see this guy? He's not circumcised. I didn't notice. Did you notice? I didn't notice. And you want, he wants to kill him because he hasn't seen his urologist. Is that, is that what's going on here? <laughs> no. Here's what he understood. It separated him from everybody else. He knew that circumcision was a sign of covenant. And what he's saying is, I'm in covenant and he is not in covenant and me and God were always a majority. And he took his little slingshot under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, flung it, it hit him in the head. And he said, now I'm gonna show you how to get ahead, knocked him out and took his head. Come on, somebody. Now, I said all of that to bring you to this. Now listen to this, verse 21. After consulting the people, Jehoshaphat appointed men to sing to the Lord and to praise him for the splendor of his holiness. And they set out against the army. Now watch this. You're sitting there thinking, man, I'd sure like to be here with Michael Letney. Up here on the stage, Lamar and all these people up here, Sarah up here. I'd like to be up here singing with them. Glory to God, hallelujah. Well, now he said, now, by the way, I want you to come to the choir. He said, but I want the choir to go out in front of the army in battle. How many of you know that was a bad day to recruit for the choir? Come on, somebody. <laughs> but watch. Here is the power of one degree. Because they began to praise when there was no reason to praise. Listen to me. Praise, then power. Praise, then power. Praise, then power. Now watch this, verse 22. And as they began to sing, listen to me. It's not praise if you're just sitting there watching the platform. It's not praise if you're just reading the words off the overhead screens. It's not praise to watch somebody else worship in the congregation. It's not praise until you begin to do it. What would happen in a place if 100% of the people would give themselves over to praise and worship? What kind of presence would invade that hall? I love this. As they began to praise. Now watch. It's the power of one degree. They don't have to praise. There's no reason for them to praise. But they begin to praise. The Lord sets ambushments against the men of Ammon 
and Moab and Mount Seir who were invading Judah, and they were defeated. The men of Ammon and Moab rose up against the men of Mount Seir to destroy and annihilate them, and they finished slaughtering the men from Seir. They helped destroy one another. Look at verse 24. The men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and overlooked toward the vast army. They saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. This was not a military victory. This was a worship and praise victory. I'm telling you, God wants to invade our services. The difference between Christianity and every other religion on the face of the earth is our founder shows up to every meeting. If we'll recognize and, and praise him, he'll manifest his presence. Last point here, verse 25. Thank you, brother. So Jehoshaphat and his men carried off their plunder, and they found among them a great amount of equipment and clothing and also articles of value, more than they could take away. There was so much plunder that they, it took three days to collect it. And the fourth day they assembled in the Valley Baraka where they had praised the Lord. This is why they call the Valley Baraka to this day because Baraka means praise. The last principle and those eight principles up there is this, is provision. If you will confront your problem, if you will confront the fact that there's no solution, God will make provision for your life. Why do we worship? Go ahead and put it on the screen. Why do we worship? Now look at this. Here's my definition of worship. I want you to see this. It comes out of the two tenses of this word, the two, the prefix and the suffix. The, the, the prefix wor means worth or value. The, the suffix ship means condition. When you begin to worship, listen to this. When you begin to worship in your situation, whatever that is, you acknowledge the worth and value of God in your situation. Now watch this. Worship reminds us of God's power. Worship opens up heaven's resources. Psalm 22.3 says, listen to this carefully. Psalm 22.3 says, God is enthroned in the praises of his people. What does that mean? When he's enthroned, he sits on his throne as king and Lord in your situation. And as Lord in your situation, he dispenses what is necessary to meet your need in your crisis. And lastly, worship confounds and confuses the enemy. We saw that in the text. Now, I don't have time to go into this story, but we were working with a Satanist and helping her in her salvation experience. And when that took place, she began to share some things. She said there are, there's literally times in the calendar when Satanism tries to invade churches, but they can't invade churches that have legitimate praise and worship because it confuses and confounds them. God's about to hit this place. Now, you say, oh, that's great. That's old covenant. Is there anything in the new covenant? As a matter of fact, there is. Turn with me to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. My favorite story in the book of Acts, here is Paul and Silas. Now, the Bible tells us that Paul and Silas were out obeying God. And behind them came a sorcerer who was saying things like this. Paul and Silas are great people. Paul and Silas are of the Lord. Now watch this. Paul turns around and casts out the demon of that person. Why? They were saying the truth. Because he didn't want to be associated with the people that were making that kind of prophecy. Now watch this. So they threw them into jail. Threw them into prison. Look at verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners overheard them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prisons were shaken. Wow. And at once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains broke loose and they left. And when the jailer woke up, he went to them, watch this now, and he said, what must I do to be saved? And they led him to the Lord. Now I wanna tell you this story, the, word, the way I heard a black preacher tell this story. I don't know why black preachers just tell it better than white preachers, they just do. And he said, Paul and Silas were thrown into jail. 
It was a damp, dark, human uh, situation. They were probably taking their hands and their feet, and they were attached in shackles to the wall. They saw little rats going across the floor, that damp, human floor. And in a moment, along about midnight, Paul said, Silas! Silas said, yes, Paul. Paul said, Silas! Paul, and Silas said, yes, Paul. Silas! He said, I feel a hallelujah coming on. And he said, that praise went up to the atmosphere. That praise went up to the stratosphere. That praise went up to the ionosphere until it hit heaven. And God was sitting on his throne. He went, hey, hey, hey. He said, what's that I hear? The angel said, that's just music. He said, no, that's not just music. That's my kind of music, praise and worship. And he began patting his foot to the music. And that pat went down through the ionosphere, down through the stratosphere, down through the atmosphere until it hit that prison cell. And an earthquake came and it set the captives free. Praise and worship sets the captives free. Now, what did they do? What did they do in that situation? Let me ask you this. What would you have done in that situation? What would you have done if you were obeying God and you were thrown into prison? I'd like to say I'd praise and worship him. I don't know. But chances are I would have been wondering, God, if I'm obeying you, why am I in this situation? But they did what Hebrews 13, 15 says is a sacrifice of praise. Now put this up on the screen. Look at number two. Here's what a sacrifice of praise really is. It's not just praising when you don't feel like it. It's more than that. Look at number two. You have to sacrifice the right to know everything to trust the one who does. Sometimes situations come up that we don't understand, but the good news is he does. You have to sacrifice the right to the blessing you think is due you to receive the blessing God has for you. See, they must have thought the blessing would have been God's provision in the situation they were in. But they realized, they didn't realize there was a bigger process. There was a bigger blessing. When they led that Philippian jailer to Jesus Christ, that was the start of the church at Philippi. The Philippian church came out of this encounter. They had to sacrifice the right to the blessing they thought was due them to receive the blessing God had for them. Let me finish with this. I was pastoring our first church in East Texas and things were going well, but not great. I really didn't know what I was doing. And in two years of that, my initial pastor, we went from 50 people to 95. Now, you can look at that two ways. One is we doubled our congregation, or two, Church Growth Magazine did not call us. And so, all of a sudden, as we moved into that next year, in five months, we quintupled. And we went on to grow to be the largest church in that town of 18,000 people. Now, here was what was interesting. People were coming from everywhere. People, were, this builder from, from Houston came up. He's a multimillionaire builder. He said, God told us something's happening in this town. There was a builder from Chicago who came in and said, God told us there's something happening in this town. Well, this, this builder from, from California, he, he, he just thought I was the best thing for his life, but just loved my teaching and my preaching. But all of a sudden, in about five or six months, he suddenly thought I was of the devil. And he wrote a letter, not to the church, to the entire county, to Anderson County. And he wrote a letter and said, Ron McIntosh is a man of sin. Stay away from him and stay away from his church. And I thought to myself, oh my God, my ministry's over before it begins. What if people believe this? I felt like Paul and Silas. I examined my life. I knew there was no gross sin in my life. I didn't know what to do, and the phone started ringing off the hook, and it rang, and it rang, and it rang, and people were saying, what's the sin, what's the sin, what's the sin? Finally, I had to just get out of town for a while. But on that Saturday, I knew I was coming back in for Sunday. I came into my office, and I began to pray. Now, in that day, the way I would pray is I would get out from behind my desk, and I would come and sit on the other side of the desk, kind of vacating the chair, saying, Jesus, symbolically, you're in charge. And when I did that, I started to pray, and I looked up, and behind my desk was one of my most prized possessions, a picture of Jesus laughing. 
And I looked at that picture, I said, what are you laughing at? And if this is clear as I've ever heard anything, I heard him say, you. <laughs> and he said, don't you know, son, that my hand is upon your life and that you are not guilty of what you've been accused of. And he said, I want you to know that I'm with you. I looked at him and he was laughing and I started laughing. And for 30 minutes, I was laughing and praising and worshiping and laughing and praising and worshiping. And at the end of that 30 minutes, I was free, brother. I was free. Now, hang on. The next morning, I woke up. I was still free, but not quite as free as I was the night before. And you, you don't know what's going to happen when nobody shows up. Every, you just don't know what's going to happen. People who hadn't been to church for years showed up, brother. We were jammed to the rafters wanting to know what the sin was. As we began to worship in that service, all I could do was realize that every eye was not on the platform or on God. It was on me. So finally, I stopped the service and I came to the platform. And I took the microphone and I said, I make no defense of my life. I've lived my life as an open book for you for two and a half years. If you don't know who I am by now, you never will know who I am. And furthermore, I don't ask you to come against this man, but to love him and to love him into the, back into the body of Christ. Every, at a, a moment, so everybody stood to their feet. They began clapping and cheering. We didn't lose a dime. We didn't lose a member. And God said to me, if you learn to worship me in the difficult times, I will always take care of of you. God's presence is about to hit your crisis. In this place, in here, right now, today. To the dimension you handle your crisis is the extent of your victory in your life. Bow your head and close your eyes. Nobody looking around, please. Father, I've done the best I can do this morning trying to communicate the legacy of this king for our lives. Now, Father, move on the hearts and the lives of people. Change, transform, heal, and deliver. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. You may be here and you say, I know exactly what you're talking about. I have a problem that doesn't have a solution. I have a crisis. I don't know what to do. Maybe you're here and you say, I need healing in my body. I need a touch from God. I'm dealing with cancer. I'm dealing with issues. I need a touch from God. Or maybe you're here and you say, I need God's provision. I'm not making it. Things seem to be discombobulated in every area of my life. Maybe you're here and you're broken because a relationship has been disintegrated. And God needs to put it back together. You don't have peace in your life. You don't have joy in your life. Maybe you're here and you had a dream and it's just gone. It's lost. Or maybe, just maybe, you're ready to step into more. You know there's more and you're ready to step into it. Now here is the power of one degree. The power of one degree is that you can step into the more. Heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around. If one of these things that I said or something like it that didn't exactly hit, but you know there's a, a need in your life. When I count to three, I want you to slip your hands up in this place. Are you ready? One, two, three. Yes, all over, all over, all over, all over, all over. You can put them down. You can put them down. Now here is the power of one degree. The power of one degree is that you just don't acknowledge it and recognize it. The power of one degree is you do something about it. So now, I'm gonna to count to three a second time. And when I do, every one of you who slipped your hands up into the air or didn't and should have, when I count to three this time, I want you just quickly to stand to your feet. Ready? One, two, three. Stand, 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 stand. Now, when I count to three this time, I want you to get out of where you are, come stand down here at the altar. And the rest of us, when you come, we're gonna shout and clap and praise because we know God's about to do something in your life. Ready? One, two, three, come, 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 come. For the balcony, for the balcony, for the back props, come, come, come. Come on, keep clapping, keep clapping. Come on, come on, come on. We're waiting on you from the balcony, come on. We're waiting on you, come on. Stand back up the aisles, that's okay, stand back up.
something else to keep coming. Don't stay paralyzed in your fear, but begin to do the power of 1%. Come on, we're still waiting. Come on, come on, come on. Come on, come on, come on. I love this. They're still coming. 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 If you have to back up the aisles, that's okay. Now, here's what I want. I want the rest of you that are in your seats to stand to your feet. Wherever you are, stand to your feet. Now watch. Here's what God is saying. What would happen? What would happen if we just abandoned ourselves to praise and worship? What kind of presence would God put in this place? It's not watching what takes place on the platform. It's not watching what someone else is doing. Your praise is something you have to enter into. Hands uplifted all over this place. Let's worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Waymaker, 